Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending this panel today. I think it's a really good pairing with the previous two presentations because um, we're sort of looking at the social action and social consciousness side of what you can do with literature, which is, I know, a part of the liberal arts curriculum. And um, this morning's keynote address, uh, Dr. Bauerlein was talking about some of the, I guess, the pitfalls of too much social activism in the humanities context. And uh, that, putting that aside for a moment, I would like us to think about the benefits of what reading can do in terms of raising awareness and social consciousness. That is a larger question for this panel. So, this panel, by the way, I'm Dr. Habar. I'm, I teach in the English department. This panel on literature and diversity at OU takes as a starting point that true critical readership requires engagement with writers from diverse backgrounds, both in terms of culture and gender, and diverse forms of narrative which may or may not be in print or printed form. These six students who are presenting today, they range from freshmen to seniors, will present their work from four different courses at Oglethorpe, Oglethorpe over the course of the past year. And those courses include uh, Core 101, Narratives of the Self, World Literature, Ethnicity in American Literature, and Post-Colonialism and Writing Back. I'm very proud of all of them. Um, I'd like to thank them in advance for their hard work, their professionalism, their creative insights, and for, when it applies, their courage in participating today. So without further ado, Kadeja. Okay, good afternoon. So to start, I have a handout which will give you some of my major points. This is a paper that I'm going to read today. There are also some critical questions and some sources in case you'd like to go back and look at some of the things that I've talked about today. I only have 15 copies, which as you can see is a problem, but I will just ask a few to each table. And if you all could, then please share. Okay, so just by way of introduction, my name is Kadeja Scott, as Dr. Habar mentioned. I am a senior in the English department here, and I've taken both the post-colonialism class and currently I'm enrolled in the Ethnicity in American Lit. So this paper is, what, what excuse me, was the first short paper that we did for this class. And the title is, um, it concerns ethnicity and assimilation as well as misrepresentation. Archaically, the term ethnicity described a racial or cultural group bound by national identity. Occasionally, someone might have discussed how that version of ethnicity is related to race, region, religion, gender, and class, but not about the entire concept of ethnicity as perhaps being an amalgamation of all of these aspects of identity. When we realize the simple fact that each of these identities varies among individuals of common racial and national backgrounds, is it possible to remain true to ethnicity if it can be so much more than racial or cultural background? And if not, why are critics like Langston Hughes and the Negro Artist in the Racial Mountain, published in 1926, and Frank Chin in Come All Ye Asian Writers of the Real and Fake, published in 1991, concerned with what is real? Excuse me. Perhaps ethnic authenticity is debated within ethnic groups because even though there may not be one way of being ethnically authentic, there are insidious ways of being unfair in one's representation of ethnicity and ethnic characters. So to trouble this point and to explore what is at stake when we discuss ethnic authenticity in literature, I want to put Chin and Hughes's points into conversation with each other to construct an idea of what good literary representation means in terms of ethnic authenticity. Now though I am using Asian American and African American works to explore this question, I do not intend to consider the two identities as the same but rather as two related and simultaneously turning gears in the machine of ethnic American literature. But even when examined this way, tensions between the two become apparent, yet the commonalities are starkly evident against the historically white background of American literature. 
In discussing what is at stake when ethnic literature is inauthentic, Chin and Hughes shared the concern of the threat of assimilation. This is the fear that ethnic writing, specifically ethnic American writing, may cease to differ from mainstream canonical white writing, partially because of the dual identities or double consciousness of American ethnic writers. In his essay, Hughes makes a few assumptions about the family background of a young Negro poet who he says wants to write like a white poet. Hughes assigns to that young Negro poet the subconscious and cultivated ambition to be white, and his characterization thus vividly illustrates the problem in many works of African American or Negro literature of the early 20th century. And since the early 1900s was a time of renaissance in Negro writing, can we assume that this ambition to be white has continued in contemporary literature and resulted in assimilation? Perhaps it has, but I am unwilling to concede that this assimilation has taken a very firm root. For if it had, we would not still be in the midst of conversations about double consciousness. Maxine Hong Kingston's repeated referral to her own double consciousness in The Woman Warrior is evidence that in Asian American literature, there are tensions within texts about where one belongs. Kingston struggles with this question in the no-name woman section of The Woman Warrior, where she says, Chinese Americans, when you try to understand what things in you are Chinese, how do you separate what is peculiar to childhood, to poverty, insanities, one family? What is Chinese tradition and what is the movies? Kingston's call here to other Chinese Americans illustrates that she has been concerned with this issue of identity before and that knowing that her family was just one Chinese-American family of many has troubled her, probably through her entire life, but especially as she was writing The Woman Warrior. Within the text, Kingston herself is troubling the idea of ethnicity, wrapping poverty and insanities into the ethnic equation, while at the same time being concerned with which part of her ethnic identity is most authentic. The above passage, which I read, is only one instance of Kingston's theme of assimilation or not. Throughout the text, we see that Kingston is concerned with what was her village, and it is clear that Kingston does not wish to ignore one identity for the other. But I hesitate to claim that it is out of an underhand unfairness to Chinese culture that she is willing to rewrite Chinese history and fairy tales in an American form. Of course, some would argue that the revisionist nature of her tale is unfair and inauthentic, but the real issue here is representation and to what extent ethnic authors should be cultural custodians. The critic Frank Chin targets Kingston's work for criticism because of her use of the Fa Mulan tale, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, which he claims that Kingston rewrites to the specs of the stereotype of the Chinese woman. He wants to point out what he feels is a blatant disregard for real Chinese history designed to appeal to Western audiences in the Christian form of an autobiography at a loss of humanity and authenticity. But we have already seen Kingston struggle with the concept of what is real and what is fake and her attempts to figure out what is Chinese tradition and what is the movies via her memoir. Literature can certainly preserve or create culture, and ethnic literature perhaps performs this even more so when mainstream white audiences read works by ethnic writers. In some of these mainstream minds, it may be better for ethnic Americans to be represented at all and be subject to unfair representation than not to appear in literature. That sort of mindset, I caution you, is damaging, but at the same time, Good representation need not always favorably depict its ethnic characters. For example, in Richard Wright's Almost a Man, published in 1940, the main character, Dave, is a teenage boy who is so consumed with owning and firing a gun that he makes a dreadful mistake and kills his boss's mule. This is certainly not a happy outcome for Dave, but Wright accomplishes something here in communicating to a potentially white audience that a black character like Dave is capable of higher level ambition and that Teenage boys of any race share a few and occasionally detrimental developmental qualities. Characters like Dave humanize people of color, and this happens through their representations in ethnic writing. In addition, the nameless mulatto young man in The Sheriff's Children, published in 1899 by Charles Chestnut, commits suicide, but his characterization is empathetic. He is an everyman, and Chestnut's writing of a Negro character as representing more than himself and potentially non-Negroes as well, was novel at the time. Neither Wright nor Chestnut necessarily acted as cultural custodians by representing good ethnic characters, but they did represent characters well. The risk of assimilation and misrepresentation are not the only threats to ethnic authenticity, but they are pervasive. Literature could stand to lose authentic ethnic voices if these voices are forced to be white 
and conform to traditionally Western forms to be read. At the same time, if ethnic American authors attempt to write all of their characters as good people, representation suffers. In this way, ethnic literature is necessarily a political project, just as it is a personal one, performed with diverse voices and intentions. handouts um, and I also only have 15 so I hope this works out but, um, Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Monica. I'm a second year student here, and I'm currently working towards a major in conservation biology. The reason I mention this is because this is a panel on diversity, and diversity can also mean interdisciplinary. I think I'm probably one of the only people speaking on this panel who isn't an English major. Um, and I'm an English minor, and I've always struggled to find that sort of bridge between science and literature, because when I say I'm majoring in biology, but I'm minoring in English, people say, well, why? Like, what's the connection? So that's something that I try to address in this presentation, and that's what I hope to convey today. Um, so sort of the main points of this. Something my high school teacher always used to tell me is that nothing is ever written in a cultural void, meaning that your environment is constantly shaping everything that you do, everything that you write comes from some sort of influence. So I want to speak towards the interdisciplinary nature of science and literature by talking about the way that historical context shapes literature. And historical context means a lot of things. Um, and I'm specifically going to be talking about geography and anthropological studies. Um, so science is sort of a broad term to define the two specific things I'll be talking about today. Um, so I'm also going to be looking at a link between scientific or you know, geographical anthropological elements to two specific pieces of literature, um, which are epic poems. So if you look at that handy dandy handout I gave you, you will see a definition for epic poems for those of you who don't know. Um, epic poetry usually refers to really long poems that are written in narrative form describing heroic deeds of a person or a group of people and they're very culturally relevant to their origin. Um, usually you'll think of the Odyssey or Beowulf. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different ones. And the reason I'm talking about epic poems is because they have a very unique position. Because of their cultural relevance, they have the ability to simultaneously reflect and define cultural norms, the societal norms. A, lo a lot of literature does that, but epic poetry specifically has a very significant place in a culture's history, which is why I chose to talk about it. And the effects of epics are very significant, but I want to talk about potentially quantifying those effects, so talking about something that can be measured. So, two case studies. I'm going to be talking about the Ramayana and Sundiata. If you've taken um, Core 101 with Dr. Lutz, you've studied Sundiata. Um, so, I'm going to be discussing two seemingly innocuous elements that are not particularly relevant to the text and uh, talking about how they represent cultural realism and how that is relevant. And another definition I put on there is cultural realism, which is moments within a text which speak to specific cultural truths that um, relate to the culture that the literature came from. And that's especially important in epic poems because a lot of these are studied for universal truths. So cultural realities speak to sort of the opposite end of that. Okay, so if you look on the handout, you'll see that I put a little summary of the Ramayana on there which is basically an Indian epic poem that's talking about the story of an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. I don't know how familiar you are with um, Hindu mythology, but it's basically um, a god who's reincarnated as a king, and it's a story of how he tries to bring his wife back from a kidnapper. 
I mean, there's of course a lot more to it, but that's what I'm focusing on. And the thing I'm focusing on specifically is a geographical element of this epic, and that is Adam's Bridge or Rama Sethu, um, which is the site at which um, Lord Rama's army had to build a bridge to get to Sri Lanka, where his wife was being held captive. This is an actual literal bridge, is my point. Um, in 2010, NASA technology discovered that the bridge was actually there, um, just as it's described in the epic. And it's made of shoals, and it's only 18 miles long. It's not particularly significant. Um, and it used to be a strait. The reason they discovered it is because they looked into why ships who needed to trade around the region kept having to go across around Sri Lanka to get to where they needed to. And so they um, had to establish this thing called the Sethu Samadram shipping channel, um, which would involve basically destroying the strait. And of course, that did not go over very, very well. It caused protests from both the scientific community and Indian religious groups, which I think is fascinating because the scientists argue for the preservation of the marine life ecosystem around the area. It's something that's been put in place for thousands of years, so suddenly sending ships through for constant trade would disrupt that natural ecosystem. And the religious groups are arguing that it should be made into a historical monument because of its cultural significance to the area. And why I think this is significant is because the Ramayana is an epic story and it's been passed on through, through oral tradition for centuries. If you study um, Indian history even a little bit, you will hear about this or the Mahabharata. And I think it's fascinating that a geographic aspect of the story is being called to become historical monument status. And it really speaks to the importance of tradition in the culture where it originated, to the fact that it would, it would be called to be made into a historical monument. Okay, and the second thing I'm talking about is the baobab tree from Sundiata. Um, I don't know how many of you read it, but there is a very significant scene in that in which Sundiata finally um, regain or no, is no longer a cripple, and he lifts up the baobab tree to bring leaves to his mother. And I'm going to talk about it anthropologically and how it's related to community development. So, I'm sorry, that's not a relevant slide. Okay. Um, so community development in relation to this tree. So studies were done on the relationship between how the trees were distributed and how settlement in southwestern Mali was distributed. So they did chi-squared analyses and they basically determined through statistical tests that um, there was a significant positive spatial association between baobab presence and human settlement, which basically means that humans tend to settle where there are baobab trees. And that's pretty intuitive, like that you don't need science to tell you that. But the reason I bring it up, I mean obviously people are likely to do that because it is a very important tree. It provides not only food, but it can be used for clothing and medicine and um, technical supplies. It's one of those trees that you can use in many, many different contexts. It's actually the tree in The Lion King when Rafiki's in it. Um, <laughs> but again, uh, why I bring this up is because they couldn't find scientific reasoning for which baobab leaves are preferred. They did a ton of tests about their nutritional value, um, and basically they couldn't determine why certain people just picked certain leaves. It was just something that people seemed to know. And specifically, the women in these communities seemed to know which leaves to pick and which leaves not to. Um, so that leads to a lot of possibilities and interpretations. First of all, I don't think people are very aware of how highly these communities depend on these trees. And the inclusion of the baobab tree seemingly innocuously into this literature speaks to the importance of cultural elements generally in literature, but also on the literary end it leads to interpretive possibilities because this community is so incredibly dependent on the baobab tree. Um, it might speak to like Sundiata is a king, he's an emperor, so when he conquers the trees he might also be conquering his dependency and showing his superiority as the ruler. So that is another possibility that I thought of when I thought about that. Um, so. I don't think this was a particularly significant connection that I made, like I am not going to be um, writing to a journal anytime soon. I just think it's important because it sparks conversation and it starts bridging that gap, you know, people think that it's a really huge gap between science and literature, but really science is a really important factor in the way that literature plays out. And literature in turn does that too. because. 
you know, it might be possible that since Sundiata is such a big oral tradition in southwestern Mali, that might be something that is passed on to some sort of subconscious knowledge of which Baobab leaves to choose and which ones not to. Um, and it always allows for further analyses on the role that cultural realism has in ancient literature um, and how it affects modern day literature and cultural realities. So that is all. Do you want a question? No. Um, I was just curious as to how NASA found that the route between Sri Lanka and India was... Yeah, it was through the ISS. You can actually... Um, they, they were using technology to you know, scout geographic locations, and they discovered that tiny strait between Sri Lanka and India. It was through their um, space technology. But is the strait, like, where the land is underneath water, is it raised? Is yeah, that it's, why they, they mm -hmm. can't go through? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not raised to the point where, like, you can probably take a day trip over it, but it would be difficult for ships to pass through. Like, it's enough so that ships couldn't pass through. But, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I was wondering, there's a lot of discussion about Sri Hi, my name is Hayden Spies. I'm a freshman here at Oglethorpe, and today I'm going to be talking about the practice and representation of sati, which is a, an ancient Hindu ritual and world literature, and I'm going to introduce this topic first by speaking a little bit about widows in Indian society. I first became interested and aware of this topic in reading Rabindrana Tagore's novel Chilkar Bali, which is a colonial story set in 1800s India, and one of the protagonists, considered to be by some the main protagonist of the novel, is a widow named Benodini, and part of her dilemma as a woman and as a widow within the novel is her limited agency, but her status as a widow has surprisingly little import to me within the interpersonal relationships that are the focus of the novel, um, given the setting and the time. Um, the author, Tagore, he does reference the restrictions placed on widows within modern, life, modern at the time, life, at the, at, in passing, but it only really becomes central until the end, um, when she refuses an offer of marriage, in her words, because religion and society would not tolerate it. The caste system, for those of you that are unfamiliar, just a little bit of background. It's a rigid system of class, and you're assigned to a given caste at birth, and it affects aspects of life such as marriage and job prospects. You really can't change, at least favorably, from the caste that you've been born into. And it also prescribes degrees of social participation, or on the other end, segregation. And this is all dictated by the Dharma Shastras, which is the sacred law book of Hinduism. Uh, so widows within a traditional caste society, um, they experience social restrictions akin to those of members within the lower castes. And in an article that's featured in the Indian Streams Research Journal, uh, Nitika Thakur writes that in the patriarchal Hindu society in which women derive their status from their husbands, widows have always been regarded as symbols of misfortune and their presence was thought inauspicious at happy occasions. 
And she also notes the severe discipline that can be imposed on widows. And this is, uh, as I mentioned, seen briefly in Tagore's novel, uh, particularly the fact that widows are required to prepare their meals separately from the food that the family will be eating. And obviously this has practical implications within the lives of women. Uh, Dr. Mohini Giri, I think she's an important point to bring up in this discussion because she's an example of the shifting focus within modern media. She is an activist who is concerned with bettering the lives and status of widows in India, and she advocates for improved health care and just general outlook. And I think it is one of her greatest accomplishments that she's bringing this to the attention of world media. She's been featured on BBC news programs. And so I think it's interesting that there's that shifting focus and awareness. So sati itself is an ancient ritual. It's sometimes still practiced, although very rarely. And this essentially involves a widow, a widow voluntarily flinging herself onto her deceased husband's funeral pyre. And like I said, this is voluntary, but cultural pressure would definitely play a role in the decision to commit this act of self-immolation. And it's not a universal in Hindu history, but it would be encouraged by the low status of widows within society. Okay, so within world literature, the different representations, I want to talk about Western perceptions versus kind of cultural truths and the concepts of devotion and love that are behind this ritual. Um, I think it's easy sometimes for outsiders particularly if it's a Westerner, to formulate negative judgments very quickly, uninformed judgments about sati and widows within Indian society. And I think this is nicely represented in actually an American text, a famous American text, Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell. Um, when Brett Butler, who's a very cosmopolitan and worldly character, makes reference to this Hindu ritual, and Scarlett's reaction kind of exactly captures that quick and uninformed judgment, she essentially reduces it to barbarism and makes determinations about anyone that would participate in this. But um, this isn't something that can be understood in such black and white terms. And I think it's important to note, um, on the other end, the, the importance of devotion in the culture in which sati originates, and uh, that is a very important aspect of the issue. And then in modern media, there's a film by Kuti Majmudar uh, it's called The Mem Saib, and it's transnational marriage in colonial India. And I think it's notable because it represents this um, ritual favoring a perspective that is both female and Indian, and it's, I think, a nice answer to the kind of quick Western judgments and misperceptions that I was speaking to. And so I'd like to end with a clip from this movie that illustrates my point. Ninety-eight, the queen of Begum population is well after the death of her husband. It took many years, every day and night. She would think of nothing else. She watched as it was built, stone by stone, and lifted it to the townspeople, so they would always remember the beneficence of that great thing. From that time on, it's been used for water, gatherings, worship, theater, refuge during the heat and war, and so much more. In this culture, devotion knows no boundaries. Such a beautiful story. What of sacrifice? Well, that was one of its uses. When the land was completed, she drowned herself in it. So that she would be by his side. In death. And lives beyond. So I think that's a nice representation. And like I said, it favors a voice that perhaps doesn't usually get a lot of attention. And it's another example of the shift in modern media, and that's my presentation.
Hey guys, um, I have a few handouts just to outline what I am presenting, and if you could just pass that back. You don't also have fits in here. I have fits in here. Okay, so, um... My name is Michelle Hong. I am a freshman, and I am a biopsychology major. Today I will be presenting a Prezi I had done in Core 101 with Dr. Gabar. Um, it's about women, community, and race. Um, here I connect a supplementary core text, uh, The Book of the City of Ladies, and a contemporary film, The Help. Um, because this is the panel on diversity in literature, I would like to address the question, what exactly is the role of literature in society. Literature exists not only for entertainment, but as a teaching tool. It incorporates morals and lessons, as well as deeper connections to the self and society. Um, the Book of the City of Ladies and the Help is not only about standing up for equality, it teaches us to come together, as well as to be better selves. And the great thing about literature is that it comes in various forms, and it will always be a teaching medium of choice. introduce this text and film. The Book of the City of Ladies is written in 1405 by Christine de Pizan. Her narrative comes out of her frustration she feels about the outburst against women. She enters a dreamlike state where she is approached by three ladies sent by God, Lady Reason, Lady Justice, and Lady Rectitude, and together build an allegorical city for all worthy and brilliant women. The city walls are built upon the success and achievements women have gained in the past and present centuries. The Help is a 2011 film directed by Tay Taylor and is famously based on the 2009 novel <coughs> produced by Catherine Stockett. It sets it sets in the 1960s, which is the civil rights era in America. The story is told from perspectives of three protagonists: Skeeter, Abelian, and Minnie. Skeeter, a white female, aspires to write a novel in the perspective of the help who are African-American maids working for white households. Aveline and Minnie are the first of the maids to agree to share their accounts with Skeeter. And now we will explore some connections I've made between these two. Um, one is that both texts exclude certain individuals from their groups. In Pizan's, plea, in Pizan's piece, her allegorical city allows only women of extraordinary consistency and virtue a place of residency and in the hell. See that. 
that racial barriers are readily present. Um, there's also the, conne the connection where women were to follow certain customs identified with female sex. This went along this went along the guidelines of getting married, bearing children, and completing housework. Um, women were also denied an education, and this led to the bold perception that women were dull and incapable. And the help is he tried to engaged. After she got that talent job, her mother said she was just swimming in proposals. Well, good for the fat fanny people. Uh, Eugenia, your eggs are dying. Would it kill you to go on a date? Just show a little gumption. Careful now, careful. Oh, now look at this. This dress is just precious on you. Just take it in a little here, a little there. Get your hair fixed. I got a job today. Where? Riding for the Jackson Journal. Great. You can write my obituary. Charlotte Phelan, dead. Her daughter, still single. <laughs> From that scene, we see that Skeeter's mother is very unaccepting, that she's not a normal woman. The other connection I made was that the authors of the, this text and this film um, deliberately included women. Uh, the design did this to refute the idea that the female sex is inferior and of lesser value, and to bring together women of merit. Taylor, the director of The Help, did so to join the hands of women from unlike the worlds and to talk about courageous, beautiful, strong women, because he felt that most stories and documentaries have been from the standpoint of men. And my last connection is general. Um, both show the theme of courage and resistance. Against all odds, the main characters of these two literary texts rise up against the state and society, trying to disprove the erroneous beliefs of that time period. Pizan attempts to convince her audience, which consisted mostly of men, out of the misconception that women were weak, were weak and unable. Skeeter, Abley, and many speak out about the racial mistreatment towards the African-American maids by the high society white class. That's not so impressive. My name is Kellen Flatt. I'm a freshman. I had Dr. Ramar for World Literature in Core 101, but I'd like to discuss something that um, was presented to me in Core 101, which is the lack of presence of female voices in the narratives of the self. And I would also like to address the diversity in forms of the form of the form that a narrative takes. So I will be reading part of a paper and then presenting a little bit of a project. Um, I discussed Say Shonigan's The Pillow Book from Japan from 1002, and The Book of the City of Ladies by Christine de Pizan from 1405, and also The Odyssey by Homer and Hamlet by Shakespeare. And in order to discuss how Shonigan and de Pizan's text correct the depiction of women in literature, I must first discuss how classic authors such as Homer and Shakespeare incorrectly show women. When Odysseus and Hamlet become the heroes of their respective texts, they leave very few archetypes for women to fill. And although the available archetypes give women power and therefore significance, each archetype relies on a man. The mother must give birth to a man, the sister accompanies her brother, the mistress seduces a man, and the bride functions as the committed partner of a man. I believe that by using these archetypes, Homer and Shakespeare make it clear that women cannot maintain significance in the face of masculine heroism, and that their only significance comes when they support a man in his quest for greatness. I also believe that the way Homer and Shakespeare's respective texts neglect women as three-dimensional figures draws away from their central themes and their messages. The fact that these two great authors only depict half the human race as competent without help significantly diminishes the themes that Homer and Shakespeare want to convey. I think that this because they do not feature both men and women as competent and thus take away from their own credibility due to their incorrect assumption that women and women characters cannot function capably. Because of this, texts such as Say Shonigan's The Pillow Book and Christine de Pizan's The Book of the City of Ladies 
become necessary in order to fill in the gaps left by Homer and Shakespeare's blatant gender bias. In the book of The City of Ladies, De Pizan takes a reluctant female protagonist, Christine, and exposes her to all of the good that women have done, and creates a utopia populated solely by women. The text functions as an important corrective text because it swings the daunting pendulum of the gender bias so far to the opposite side of the spectrum. The book provides historical examples of powerful women who exist outside of the base ar archetypes used by classic male authors. De Pizan writes as a woman author from the perspective of a woman in order to expose the severe gender bias that exists in society and to correct that bias that Shakespeare and Homer per perpetuate through their texts. Shawnigan's The Pillow Book works slightly differently than the Book of the City of Ladies as the text served as a diary for Shawnigan to detail her life in court. Although slightly superficial and without as obvious a purpose as De Pizan's novel, The Pillow Book provides a more realistic showing of females in society than a utopia full of only perfect women. Rather, Shawnigan details her own life as a flawed member of the court and depicts everyday life as only a true narrative of the self can. When discussing these texts in comparison with Hamlet and the Odyssey, one must consider whether they can stand up to some of the most prominent works in the literary canon. I believe that they have a quality in writing style, story, and merit as narratives of the self, but the only reason that the two female authored texts are not widely read is because they do not pander to the patriarchal society that Shakespeare and Homer profited from. They directly address issues for women and do not waste space propping women up on men, thus leaving male characters to gain all the glory. It's my belief that these two works are on the level as other works in the literary canon, but they do not receive widespread attention because women wrote them, for one text for the advancement of women and one chronicling the, an independent woman's experience. There's diversity that is necessary to address in, the, in not only the population of a narrative, but also in the form of the narrative. I'd like to now discuss uh, how a narrative can be presented in modern day by talking about community created by Dan Harmon on NBC and uh, in, com in communication with the Odyssey. And although seemingly different, Homer and the community and the Odyssey are actually very similar with regards to the conflicts they portray the main character in, thus shaping the protagonist and telling the story of, story of a narrative showing growth through conflict. The protagonists of each work Jeff Winger from Community and Odysseus of the Odyssey have very similar character arcs, something that stems from the similar plot structure. The plots rem are reminiscent of each other because Dan Harmon, the creator of Community, uses a story circle to break episodes, a story circle that he created based off of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, which was created with the Odyssey in mind. For the purposes of this project, I considered the pilot of Community and Jeff's situation and then compared it to the entirety of the Odyssey. What's so interesting about the fact that the story circle is so close to the hero's journey is that it's merely a modern interpretation of the circle. This means that stories don't actually change over time, they just adapt to fit a slightly more contemporary audience. Both works use homecoming in order to motivate the plot and show growth in the main characters, something that that's incredibly important for a narrative of the self. Conflict is important for a narrative of the self, and the similar way in which Jeff Winger and Odysseus face and deal with conflicts makes community a clear narrative. The plots are incredibly similar due to the story circle used in the two tales, however the relative merit as a narrative of the self is not directly indicated by the plots, although the plot fuels the classification. The conflict and subsequent change returning with the elixir shows a journey that has been undertaken, whether literal like Odysseus's or figurative like Jeff Winger's. An important theme in the Odyssey is the longing for and journey for Nostos, or homecoming. Odysseus' desire to return home, to be back in a situation he is in complete control of, resonates heavily with modern audiences, which is why the text has stuck around for so long. This theme also comes up in community several times, particularly in the pilot episode. However, it's not necessarily a home that Jeff Winger is propelled towards, but the concept of home that Odysseus was working towards. Home is a place where he is respected, powerful, and in control. In essence, what makes community a viable candidate for a narrative of the self is that journey it explores through a conflict and the change the protagonist goes through as a result of the journey. The structure of the story is eerily close to that of the Odyssey and follows a similar story arc. The protagonists are similar for the, in their love for power and quest for Nostos, and they resolve in similar ways, having changed. I think I'm your last presenter for the day. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I'm Sandra Harris. I'm a senior, and I will be reading excerpts from a paper um, which I submitted from Dr. Barr's postcolonial studies class last year, and it's titled "Narrative Parallelism as a Way to Normalize and Canonize the Voice of the Other." 
and I'm sure you've heard about the other a number of times here uh, this afternoon. So when reading David Copperfield by Charles Dickens or Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, an immediate recognition of the normal appearing privileged lives of the higher social classes may be evident. However, I propose that Rushdie and Dickens have provided the post-colonial reader with an opportunity to explore the inherent problem of what is perceived as, quote, normal or socially acceptable in traditional master narratives. Further, to properly reveal a parallel to the na uh, traditional narrative, I believe it is vitally important to look for an underlying theme which reveals who decides what normal is and who is allowed to demonstrate those socially acceptable norms. What makes Midnight's Children and Copperfield exciting to view from a perspective of postcolonialism is that both texts allow the voices of the marginalized to be representative of an alternate but equal underlying theme. In Cultural, Culture and Imperialism, author Edward Said theorizes British novelists of the 19th and mid 20th centuries knew that those controlling the power structure of the empire also determined the moral and social values which were to be exalted. Thus, the socially acceptable behaviors in Copperfield reflect those dictated by the powerful and the privileged within English society. However, Dickens also presents as normal or even superior many traits and behaviors exhibited by people who are not within the powerful upper strata of society and whose significance has been limited in the novel. Through conducting what Said terms contrapuntal reading, I'm able to see how Dickens reveals the true character of the traditionally accepted social class while granting relevancy, relevancy to the typically ignored social class. Although there are many ways Rusty challenges societal norms in his text, this essay focuses on the creation of an underlying narrative, which challenges or supersedes other traditional narratives. When viewed from a post-colonial perspective, people typically ignored in classic texts, such as those with handicaps, mis uh, mystical powers, or non-conforming character traits, are given a voice with Rushdie to criticize both internal nativist and external colonialist power structures. So his protagonist, Selim, has both disabilities and mysterious gifts, such as hearing voices and absorbing the conversation of his fellow midnighters like a radio receiver, which are also attitudes of mind. So his abilities are used to parallel the undulations of India's growth, or downturn, depending on the perspective, over an approximately 50 year time span encompassing pre and post independence. And that's the independence of India. Salim's writings reveal that each of the children, like himself, has a gift, which is underappreciated and even severely punished. Uh, yet he still encourages them to utilize their gifts to become relevant to the current power structures and the narrative. Because the gifts of the 101 children that he writes about parallel the differences overlooked in the infancy of India's development, they should, in Salim's mind, be represented as, quote, the true hope of freedom, and not just the bizarre, the bizarre creation of a rambling, diseased mind. However, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, who represents the traditional power structure in this narrative, um, is also responsible for the infertility of those 101 children, and we call them midnighters, as a way of silencing the next generation. So since physically the children will never be able to reproduce, thanks to Miss Gandhi, it appears that it mimics the inability for them to affect any further change. So they are marginalized. They are, supposed, they are not supposed to be heard. However, the parallel narratives include Salim's obsession with writing down and recounting their gifts and their meetings and their sufferings and all of their struggles. Thus his narrative, assure society's undesirable children that their equally relevant uh, reality will live alongside the socially accepted narrative. So I go on to mention uh, in the longer paper that one of Salim's perceived physical disabilities is his extremely large nose, bulbous nose. Um, but it's so important that it, it's actually prophesied about, believe it or not, a nose. But it's deprivileged by Evie, a young American girl, and it's also denigrated when compared to the noses found in traditional texts, which are honored 
and they're called prominent or patrician. And if you read a lot of classical texts, you'll see the patrician nose is just everything if you have that. Um, but through Rushdie's alternative narrative, Salim's large nose becomes equivalent to the noses of the more acceptable French and noble classes. So similarly, in Copperfield, Dickens also uses those physical and social handicaps, mysterious abilities, and non-conforming traits to convey an underlying theme which challenges socially accepted norms in traditional text. Uh, within the Victorian era's realm of social acceptability, Mr. Peggotty is one who has little value because he's not literally, uh, he's not literate, and he's not wealthy. Um, and you can compare that to the character that is also within Copperfield called Steerforth, whom Copperfield believes deserves a thousand respects. Okay, for example, Mr. Peggotty gives high praise to those who, quote, and these are his words, not my grammatical reading, uh, would set me down at their cottage doors and give me what for not to eat and drink and show me where to sleep. However, based on Steerforth's zoological perspective, Mr. Peggotty's homestead is merely an opportunity to, quote, see the natives in their aboriginal conditions. So although David finds the humility and generosity of time and money and spirit admirable in Mr. Peggotty, I find it interesting that even when David does have sufficient funds, when he gets to be an adult, he never takes the opportunity to advance Mr. Peggotty's social standing. I see this as Dickens' message, uh, which condemns the status quo's contradictory position. And additionally, I believe that he is revealing an alternative social narrative by showing traits in the lower class, which can be considered acceptable or even exemplary, However, possessing these traits in this world environment, in the old world environment, still is not enough to affect a permanent change in the patterns of social mobility. So in Charles Dickens, literary critic G.K. Chesterton theorizes that the optimist is a better reformer than the pessimist because the optimist is willing to see something which is inherently wrong and still be surprised enough about it to seek a change. So I conclude that both Dickens and Rushdie were such optimists. By elevating the positive traits of people who are considered some substandard and are typically overlooked in the traditional narrative, Dickens challenges the accepted Victorian social standards and offers a parallel, if not superior, narrative. And similarly, Rushdie sees problems with both his former colonizer and the colonized India and uses unusual children with unique abilities to condemn their narrow-mindedness. Both have started with the values and people socially accepted by the empire, British Empire, and then have contrasted those norms by providing another possibility. The lens of post-colonialism uh, post brings awareness to the problem of what type of people and traits are exalted in traditional narratives and Dickens and Rushdie have left enduring texts which canonize alternative novels or, or alternative narratives to include perspectives, voice, and value of the other. Thank you. And thank you for coming. questions for any of the speakers, I'm sure they feel free to answer any of anything that you might have, but I think at this point I'll just end the panel finally. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.